Well, let's begin this evening's uh, prayer meeting with prayer. Dear Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we do truly thank you for Lord, this opportunity of meeting again as your people. Father, we thank you for the blessing of having your word in our own language, of having it clearly uh, translated and Lord God, so that we can read it and understand it. Father, we thank you for the blessing of prayer, Lord, as we meet on Thursdays at the moment for prayer. We thank you for the blessing of prayer. But Lord, we just pray, Lord, tonight that you would uh, speak through your word to us. Help us, uh, Lord, help me to, to speak. Help me to to bring your word, guide and bless. And Lord, help us as we listen to your word. May your spirit truly breathe upon the word and apply it to our hearts. Or we pray that you would help us to come away from this evening with some real helpful instruction, guidance and be encouraged and inspired to to study and to look into your word. Lord, so please bless us, Lord, as we as a church at the moment can't meet together in the week. We just pray that you would bless us where we are. Be with each member, Lord, uh, all those that listen. We pray that your word would come with power by your spirit. We ask this in Jesus name. Amen. We're going to sing this evening from Psalms and Hymns 534, hymn number 534, which is in heavenly love abiding. No change my heart can fear, shall fear. And safe is such confiding, for nothing changes here. The storm may roar without me. My heart may low be laid, but God is round about me. And can I be dismayed? That's five, three, four in Psalms and Hymns.
Now, if uh, you can turn your Bibles to Romans and chapter 12, we're going to read through chapter 12 and into chapter 13. Romans chapter 12. And much of the study will be on the latter verses in chapter 13, these, the beginning verses of chapter 13. Uh, but also we'll be referring quite a bit to Timothy, 1 to 1 and 2 Timothy. But uh, let's turn to start with to Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honour giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for the good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine and I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. There is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. Those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be afraid of the authority? Do you want to be unafraid, sorry, of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but because of conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. We'll leave the reading now. As I mentioned, we'll be thinking mainly about those verses in 
chapter 13 tonight. Well, brothers and sisters, a few weeks ago, we looked at something of the Christian's experience, and much of that was from a very personal perspective. But through this period of COVID, I have become very concerned, and I expect many of you have as well, and perhaps confused um, with how we as Christians should live in this fallen world and interact with authority, authority at home, work and in society. How do we today as Christians live in this fallen world? Christians today, and especially the young, seem so resistant to authority. I'm generalising here, but from where I've seen things, there seems to be little regard for the police or for politicians alike, or even for parents or those in authority in, in the church or at school. Well, I'm not going to cover in this message the Christian's relationship to authority in the home or at work, uh, as that's covered extensively in other passages. But I want to focus on our relationship to the authorities or the state, those that are set over us in, in society. There's you probably following the news and um, recently there have been two very prominent incidents that have happened in the news. One um, in, in Canada and uh, a minister became very, very aggressive to the authorities, the police that were coming on into his church. And uh, it just about fell sh- short of swearing, but he called them Nazis and, and became very angry with them. Um, and in contrast to that, there was an incident in North London where an elderly preacher uh, who was standing on some on a pair of steps um, was approached by the authorities. And he very gently and uh, meekly uh, asked them what the problem was and responded very quietly. And he was arrested in in North London. Two incredibly different approaches to the authorities. Now, I'm not going to comment on that particularly, but just to raise the fact that there are very different ways people are dealing with the authorities at this time. Well, we read in Romans 12 some very practical guidance on how we should live with each other and treat one another in, in humility and love and, have, and be peaceable with each other. But then in chapter 13, Paul moves to our relationship to the world around us. And uh, especially um, at the beginning of this chapter to those in authority about paying our taxes, etc. But uh, covers a lot in that chapter. So I want to really look at our relationship with the authorities tonight and how we as Christians should relate to them under three headings. And they might sound a bit strange they've all got the letter a to help us remember the first one is authority the second is action or activity or activism might be another word for it and the third is ambition so we're going to look firstly at authority so we're going to begin looking at our attitude and relationship with the authority in the state now Please do remember, and I know my brothers and sisters in Mount Zion will know I have many failings and I'm speaking to myself here uh, tonight as much as anybody else. I'm just trying to bring the scriptures, um, but very much uh, speaking to my own heart here because I'm guilty of speaking down to those in high office or opposition. We we have probably different uh, parties that we support and uh, members of parliament and 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 i know at times i've spoken very disrespectfully of those that i might not agree with but tonight let's look at the scriptures and how we should be relating to those in authority firstly keep in mind the state that was in power when paul was writing this it's generally agreed that this book was written around about 58 a.d And that was just five years after Emperor Claudius 
had decreed the Jews were banished from Rome. And it's very likely, many of the commentators say this, it's very likely that the Christians were lumped in with the Jews and faced great persecution. And we know that they did face tremendous persecution at this time. But it's against this backdrop and the anti-Christian society Paul lived in that Paul gives the new believers these instructions. So keep that in mind. Paul is talking to people who are suffering for being Christians and, and suffering under the state, by the state, at the hands of the state. But in Romans 13, Paul points to the higher authority who has placed these people in places of government. Paul is calling us to take great care when dealing with those in authority over us. They're not just there because they've climbed over the backs of many others and forced their way forward. And uh, although on a human level, many of them probably have done that. Many politicians, those that reach high power, often have climbed over the backs of other people. But God has put them there. It's important to remember that these people are in power, in position of authority under God. God is on the throne. He has allowed and placed these people in their positions of authority. Our understanding has to be that they're God's civil representatives in this present world. Their principal role given by God is to judge rightly, maintain law and order. You might want to turn just for a quick reading in Job, Job 34. And we're just going to read uh, some of what Elihu says in Job 34, if you remember, Elihu was um, the young man who came after Job's three hell friends had spoken to him. And Elihu brings some very godly advice. And so Job 34, verse 17. Should one who hates justice govern, will you condemn him who is most just? Is it fitting to say to a king, you are worthless, and to nobles, you are wicked? Yet he is not partial to princes, nor does he regard the rich more than the poor, for they are all the work of his hands. In a moment they die, in the middle of the night, the people are shaken and pass away, the mighty are taken away without a hand. And Elihu's actually given Job some very good advice here. He's saying that in God's eyes, we are all equal. Very clearly, we're all equal. He doesn't look on those who are in positions of authority as any more important than the person who's sweeping the street outside. In God's eyes, we're all equal. God has, uh, has put each person in their stage of life. We as human beings are not all equal. God has given authority and power to some and not others. And we need to regard people for their position's sake. To acknowledge their position. But not to speak wrongly of those in authority with, uh, but with due respect. I speak to myself, as I mentioned before, whatever our political leaning and direction I need to respect the authorities. I need to have a regard for those who are in authority as God's ministers. We were just recently uh, reminded, we were just recently reminded of how David showed Saul great respect because of his God given authority. Saul, who was out to kill him. Saul, who was his enemy. David bowed down to him because of the God given authority that Saul had. Does this mean we blindly follow? No. I'm sure in the in Rome, when there was that persecution amongst the Christians, Christians didn't turn each other over to the Roman authorities. And in the Second World War, you know very well that many Christians uh, protected and hid Jews from the civil authorities, from the from the Germans. That wasn't wrong. That was the right thing to do because the authority, uh, the authorities were doing 
acting against God's will. And we, we, we care for those who are put into our charge. But the principle Paul gives is generally we should be good citizens. Provided we are law abiding, we shouldn't have anything to fear. Back in Romans 13, verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. In Timothy, Paul tells Timothy firstly to pray for them and even give thanks for them. And we will lead peaceful and quiet lives and then we will lead peaceful and quiet lives. Yes, give thanks. Paul could give thanks for the Roman authorities. Surely we can thank God for those over us. So that's point number one, authority. We're going to look at now action. What do I mean by this? What about our action as believers towards the authorities? How should we respond to godless decisions and directions in the state, which we face massively, don't we, in the UK at the moment? What should we be doing? Well, the backdrop to these, this question, these questions, is I've seen a growing activism amongst Christians, especially the young, as I've mentioned before, younger generations, Christians actively involved in marches, whether it be pro this or pro that, just thinking about Brexit, they were pro and anti-Brexit, BLM, Black Lives Matters, and people very strong views on that, saving the planet. I was talking with Eric on Sunday about Extinction Rebellion, uh, pro-life or pro-choice. I'm not going to go into what's right or wrong there, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not going to make comment on the validity of these uh, protests and um, some of them very, very important. But I want to look to, to scripture. What is our activity as Christians? What is our activism? As Christians, what does the word of God have to say about our acti- activity as believers? Well, I would highly recommend you read through one and two Timothy. Really helpful. Um, I read through them before this message and, and Paul is writing to Timothy and the instruction is so helpful and it's as though he's written for us today directly into our situation. So action. Let's firstly look at 1 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in godliness and reverence. So Paul is saying, as I mentioned earlier, to pray for them, saying to Timothy, pray for those who are in authority for kings, all those in positions of authority and give thanks for them. Well, thank God for our rulers. Yes. And uh, they're given by God. And remember, far worse rulers have ruled in history. Paul was saying, give thanks for the the Roman authorities, who are the most cruel and godless of people. So we need to pray for them. We need to give thanks for them. We need to have a respect and a care for them. That's the first thing. Pray for them. Secondly, avoid getting tangled up in the passing issues of the world. So 2 Timothy 2 Timothy 2. So 2 Timothy 2 verse 4, and then we'll skip over to some other verses. 2 Timothy 2 verse 4. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. So no one in, 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 sorry, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that it may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Then turn over to verse 14. Remind them of these things, 
charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself, approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. So Paul saying to Timothy, try and avoid getting caught up in worthless distractions, worthless uh, babblings, he said, he calls them babblings, which is interesting because that's what they said about the Tower of Babel when the, the language is muddled up. These are babblers. Um, so we need to be careful that we're not getting distracted. And Paul says, be grounded in God's word. Verse 15, be diligent, present yourself, approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth so don't get caught up in worthless babblings worthless discussions and arguments which really have no benefit but be grounded in the word teach the word bring your instruction from god's word so that's point two um number three so we're still under action action And the the third point here is avoid those who will turn you away from the ministry. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 to 5. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents unthankful, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. So, Paul is saying in the last times, people will be turned away. They'll become godless. They'll become unthankful. They'll become uh, unloving. They'll be traitorous. They'll be headstrong, haughty. And he says to Timothy, Timothy, turn away. Turn away from them. They're they're a distraction. Uh, They are traitors. They are turning against the authorities, and uh, you need to turn away from them. Take your attention away from them. 2 Peter 2 says this, 2 Peter 2, verse 10. Uh, Especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. So Paul is saying to Timothy, look, turn away from these people, these people who don't have any regard for authority. They uh, they're they're traitorous and they're self-willed and uh, they don't have any self-control. So what is the great action we should be involved in? We've looked at what we shouldn't do and how, who we should turn away from. Well, 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 to 5. And it tells us very clearly what, what we should be involved in. What should be our mission? What should be our activity? What should be our actions in, in the world like today? So verse one, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. 
they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of, of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So this is what we're called to. Paul says to Timothy, preach the word. Well, those of us who are not called to the pulpit or to, to teach, live the word. Live it out in your life. Actively show that you're a Christian in your life. Tell others about the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus says when he went to heaven in Matthew 28, just before he went up into heaven, he gave the disciples some instructions and that instruction passes down to us. So Matthew 28 verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is a command from the Lord Jesus Christ to us, a, a distinct, definite command. Mark 16, uh, Gospel of Mark, verse 16, very well known verse. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But, oh, sorry, verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our mission. That's our commission. That's what we've been called to do. So what do we do about these issues that are arising? What action should we be taking? Well, some people are called to a life of influence, aren't they? You think in history, uh, Lord Shaftesbury, Wilberforce, William Wilberforce, uh, in the current world where there are Christian politicians, and there's uh, personalities, I think of uh, Dan Walker, who works for the BBC. You know, we should be actively praying for them. We need to thank the Lord for Christians in these positions, and we need to be praying for them. And where we are called to maybe raise concerns, we can do that. We can add our name to a, to a list, can't we? To We can sign a petition. We can be involved in that way and even have an influence on the direction of law. And that's right. But, you know, there's even something more important we can do. As our nation becomes more and more godless and rules and laws are damaging people, especially our young people being influenced by such evil laws. These these young people and uh, adults are being damaged and twisted and being chewed up by the state and being told you can do this and you can't do that. And they're, they're all at sea. They're in a quandary. Well, we can help them. We can pray with them. We can instruct them from the word. We can teach them what the word of God says. But... Beware of being sidetracked from our core ministry. When we get involved in these things, let's remember our core ministry is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is action. We've looked at authority, our relationship to authority, our action, how we react and we act as believers. Well, lastly, ambition. What is our Christian ambition? In this world and for this world, what do we want to see happen in this world? Well, I think the Lord Jesus gives us a very, very helpful guide and steer in this. When he teaches his disciples in Matthew 6, in Matthew 6, he teaches his disciples what to pray for. Matthew 6, verse 9. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're to pray for God's kingdom to come and for his will to be done. This is a real cry of true submission for the Christian to God's authority over our lives. Not what we want. Not what we think is right and needs to happen, but your will, Lord. I bring my life into submission to your will. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. So our ambition 
in this world is to see the world being run and its peoples living in a way that honours God. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We want this world to be running and honouring the God that made it. But brothers and sisters, you know, this will not happen by us having better laws or by having a better distribution of wealth or other things in society which help individuals. Obviously, our laws in this land, we've been very blessed with Bible based laws for many, many years. And that has been a great help to us. But that won't transform our society. Those laws came out of a transformed society. And the only way the society can change is by the transformation of men and women's hearts. That's the only way our world will change is when people change. So just a quick um, reading here from the 1904 revival in Wales. Um, just a, a few comments that somebody's written about the revival in Wales in 1904. Thousands of people were saved. Public houses became empty. Men and women who used to waste their money getting drunk were now saving it and giving it to the church and they used their money to buy clothes and food for their families. Stealing and other offences became less and less prevalent. Often a magistrate would come to court and found there was no cases for him to try. Men who blasphemed learned to talk purely. The miners put in a better day's work, but the pit ponies couldn't understand what had happened to the miners as they spoke to them more kindly. They were so used to them being sworn at that they became disobedient. So the ponies didn't respond because the, the workers have become kindly and, and, and pure in their speech. People who've been careless about paying their bills or paying back money they had borrowed gave back all they owed. People who quarreled forgave each other and were reconciled. Society was changed. And Wales became a God-fearing nation. It had a massive impact in Wales, that revival. Well, that's how our society can change. So what is our ambition? Do we want a greater Britain in the world's eyes? Do we want uh, people to have a respect and regard for our flag? Do we want to save the planet, maybe? Do we want equality or and prosperity for all? These, are, these aren't bad things, but we need to be aiming higher than these things. We need to pray and have a heart for God's kingdom on earth. A transformation from the inside out, not from the outside in. Whitewash sepulchres, that was what the Pharisees were. They were Good on the outside, but inside with dead men's bones. We want people to be changed from the inside, and that's what will change our society. Well, I hope these thoughts have been helpful tonight and maybe given you a, a spark to think about these subjects and do a bit of study for yourself. And I'd suggest once again, read through one and two Timothy, a really good place to start and really get to, to grips with. And perhaps we can chat about this on a Sunday. So we've looked at the Christian and our attitude and relationship to the authority of the state, how we're to respect it, how we're to acknowledge that this is God's institution. These are God's representatives, as David bowed down to Saul. So we should in our hearts bow down to those that God have put in authority and have a respect and regard for them. We've looked at what action we should uh, be involved in not generally activism but gospel ministry that's what we're called to that's the commission we have and finally we've looked at what our ambition should be in this world and that's to see God's kingdom come to see his will established on earth to to see this land that we live in turned upside down and people to love God's word people to love the creator God and for that transformation of hearts. Well, I hope that's been a help to you. We're going to close by singing hymn 523 from Psalms and Hymns. Hymn 523. 
Keep us, Lord, O oh, keep us ever. Vain our hope if left by thee. We are thine, O oh, leave us never, till thy face in heaven we see. There to praise thee through a vast eternity. Five, two, three. Let's just close our meeting this evening with prayer. Let's pray together. Dear Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we do just thank you for your control over this world that we live in. Lord, we we thank you that it's not just left to run and just go off on its own. Lord God, but you're written onto the hearts of men. You've written on our conscience, Lord, how we need to submit to those in authority over us. You've put people in place to to watch over us, to to bring just laws, to bring judgment on society. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who who reigns. You are on the throne. And Lord, even if we have unjust rulers over us, Lord God, we thank you that we have our just God, our righteous God, heavenly God on the throne in heaven. And Lord, even if we face great injustices in the future in this land. Lord, we know we're just passing through and we're just, as it were, living in a tent and we're going to go to our eternal home. Lord, so bless your word to our hearts tonight. Help us to have learnt. Help us to take it with us and to consider our ways. Lord, we ask your blessing upon us. For Jesus' sake. Amen.